Um, thank you to Natalie for a great plenary address. We are now going to go into a panel. Um, Natalie, I'd like to welcome you back out. Hope you had a chance to get some water. Sorry that we're, we're going quickly from one place to the other, but we really appreciate you uh, leading this panel. My pleasure, my pleasure, David. Well, <clears throat> um, it's just a real pleasure for me to um, be here today with some of my favorite people um Martha Calderon, uh Marvin Frank and Kamal Bell. Um all three of you have uh I had the real pleasure of meeting you and spending time with you uh and I just want to thank you personally for sharing your stories uh with me so that I could share them in We Are Each Other's Harvest. But today I really am looking forward to us having a conversation um, and giving you an opportunity to tell your stories. So um, Marvin, why don't we start with you just with a very brief <clears throat> bio, uh, where, where you are, what kind of farm you have, and, and then we'll go on to Martha and then Kamal. Um, and then we'll get into the questions. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marvin Frank from Red Springs, North Carolina. Um, we're a cow-calf operation of raising Black Angus cattle. Um, here at Broadwood Cattle Farm, we raise uh, beef, chicken, and pork, all pasture-raised, um, no GMOs, no antibiotics. And um, now, as of today, um, beef cattle is something that's... Um, a well market right now that we all need to definitely have some food and we want to be a great source provider for that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Mar uh, Martha, why yes, don't you introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. My name is Martha Calderon. Um, we have, uh, we raised over a hundred acres of tomatoes and peppers, five varieties of peppers. We've been doing this for 17 years. And prior to that, we were migrant workers for another 17 years. I'm the mother of five children and I love what I do. Amazing. And I don't see Kamal. Ah, oh, there you are. Right here, I'm right here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Kamal Bell. I'm the CEO of Sankofa Farms. We're, uh, we do a lot of specialty crops here in Cedar Grove, North Carolina. So right now we have a lot of leafy greens. We have um, kale in the ground, different varieties, lettuce, uh, we also have some chart that's coming out, some hacker rot turnips. We have uh, seven caterpillar tunnels and then a 30 by 72 foot greenhouse. We do a lot of youth education and the whole purpose of our farm was centered around food access for our communities. So now that we're actually growing um, at scale, we're able to really um, address that or partially address it. It's such a big complex issue that is gonna take years to fully address it. And uh, we also raise honeybees here at the farm as well. So uh, we produce honey and do bee education. So um, I'm looking forward to, to, for you all getting to know more about us during the panel today. Wonderful. Well, um, I would love to start by asking each of you, um, what drew you to farming? Um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit of that story of what drew you to farming and whether you had uh, people who inspired you, I would love to hear that story. So uh, Martha, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Kamal and then we'll go to Marvin. Um, well, I was raised in Mexico and we were farmers. My parents were farmers then. And when we, my husband and I came to the United States in, in 1985, we, he has a sixth grade education. I have a ninth grade education. so. The opportunities for us were not that great. So we started to um, um, harvest orange. We went to the orange groves, but that is the toughest job you would ever do. And from the moment I got into the orange grove, I thought this is not how I'm gonna, this is not what I'm gonna do in my life. <laughs> so, you know, we started to do tomatoes and pepper speak for other companies. Then we um, moved to um, buying and selling, and then we end up um, raising our own product. We started about 17 years ago on, on you know, raising our own product, product. but basically it's because we didn't have um, other 
at the beginning, we didn't have any other choice because we didn't have any formal education. We didn't know the language. But uh, um, as we have grown into the farming um, business, uh, uh, I just learned to love it. And, and we, um, maybe not right now, but years past, it was, we, we were able to put five kids through college without, um, without any incur them incurring any debt. So farming has been really good to us and I really enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Kamal, how about you? What drew you to farming? For me, what drew me into farming was um, just wanting to empower people around me and especially the black community. Um, if someone would have asked me 10 years ago what I wanted to do, it probably wouldn't have been farming. But as I start to learn more and just see the issues and how they in the intersections of issues in our communities, I think farming touched on a lot of the things I saw that were um, that could be addressed in our community. So I think just the potential that farming holds uh, is really what drew me to to the field. And, and I think it's entrepreneurship at its like rarest form in farming um, in comparison to other industries. I think you have to really be innovative in the farming sector to um, to survive. So I think just those, just that, that point of being able to help my community and also being able to be innovative is what drew me into farming. Mm. And did you have any uh, sources of inspiration? I mean, you, you didn't come oh, from a farming family. It, yes, I, I didn't. Um, I would say that my, um, my first source of inspiration would just be just like the ideology of just learning about different black leaders and their perspectives on agriculture. Um, I definitely say Tuskegee. Um, my parents inspire me just to want to do better and to do more and to think outside the box. But I think, um, and, and then one of my farming mentors, his name is Howard Allen. He's in um, Chapel Hill. He, he's inspired me to want to do more and to, and to really address farming from the business aspect. And I think all of those things coming together has, has really inspired me. And then also our youth, just seeing the opportunities that they have. Like one of the, the youth just texted me while we're on the call, just saying, hey, I, I need to come back to the farm. He's, um, he's a, a new student. So, or he's, he's actually has a lot of the skills already. So he'll, he'll come in in a managerial um, angle. But I think just all those things uh, combined have inspired me. Amazing. Thank you. And Marvin, what about you? What inspired you? What drew you to farming? And who are some of your inspirations? Um, my father drew me to farming. Um, my father reorientated me back into agriculture uh, of where I could find a peace of mind, where I could find what, we, what I call it, agrotherapy. Um, just being outside, um, hearing the birds chirping and just finding a good place from where you can find a good understanding of healing at. So where I meet the Lord at, at the fence line every day now. Mm. Um, and um, what else drew me there is where I know where my food is coming from. And I think that's very important for each one of us to know where our food is coming from and to be part of that humane process that's going through for our livestock or for our commodity food that's coming in. Amazing. Um, you know, many of us don't know where our food comes from, as you just said, Marvin. Can you each talk through the process of farming from planting to selling? Because each of you um, is like, like uh, Kamal said, you know, you guys are farmers, but you're not just farmers, you're entrepreneurs. And so can you talk through um, with your different products just walk us through what that process is like. Who would like to start? Marvin, uh, Martha, you want to start? Okay. Okay. So, so right now, um, and, and we're in the process of, of laying plastic. Uh, we fertilize the, the 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 land, and then we put the plastic over. We usually put our set our, our transplants in April. Um, it takes about sixty days to harvest. And um, once you start harvesting, um, it's an everyday, uh, either you pick tomatoes or you pick peppers. Um, but it's, it's um, 
you have to spray them every week. You have to um, water them every day, depending on how the weather is. You have to fertilize them. Um, you have to scout them for, for diseases, for insects, to make sure that your um, crop protection program is working, that you don't need that anymore. Um, many fungicides or, or insecticides as it may be needed if you have any, any uh, funguses or, or any um, uh, insects that are coming into the field. Um, we have to deal with food safety because uh, it's a product for human consumption and most of our product is consumed um, raw. So um, that's basically it. Mm. Kamal or Marvin, who? I'll take it. Okay. I'll take it. Um, um, for us, um, it, it's a start from, uh, as cattle farmers, we're grass growers first. Um, believe it or not, mm. our main topic is soil um, for beef cattle. Um, we want to make sure that our soil is healthy first um, to make sure that we're treating everything the right way first because that's where the first intake comes in into the animals and making sure that our soil is healthy, and, <clears throat> excuse me, our soil is healthy, then our soil produces a heavy, you know, a heavy course of grass for our livestock to have plenty of. Um, and then on top of that, of course, our water. Um, we want to make sure that we have, you know, uh, heavy soil, heavy uh, fertilization of that. We, we're into what's called sectional grazing. Sectional grazing, we give our cattle so much portion at a time. Um, and then we're also into what's called regenerative farming as well. Regenerative farming. Sectional grazing and regenerative farming gets into we give them so much at a time and that helps us out with the manure ratio. Um, and then we move forward with eating more manure ratio. And then from there we can uh, spread that out and that helps us to lower our cost on fertilization, which is the number one cost of, of farming now, you know, so that helps us across the board. So grass farming is, is the main thing of every cattle farmer, we're grass farmers. And then I'm going to circle back, Marvin, to ask you about your processing and and uh, and because I know that that has been part of your vision for yes, for your operation. Uh, yes, Kamal, what about you? For us, we start with um, soil prep, and we do a lot of I guess the system that we would be considered to to be farming in is like a market gardening system. I don't like that word. I'm trying to find a different one. But for us, it starts with prepping the soil. And since we have a lot of red clay here, we um, integrate compost and we'll do a succession, which is, um, every time I say succession, that means you got a plant in, it stayed in the ground for about a month and then you pull it out. So after about the third um, succession, we will then um, integrate the native soil in the compost. So the initial process we till. So we'll till up the red clay, we'll get compost on after the third succession, after that compost is layered, we'll then till again. And then we won't have to till anymore going forward unless it's like an extreme circumstance. Um, and then after that, we have calculated, depending on the product, how many can go on each row. So our rows are 30 inches by um, 100 feet. So for a leafy green, like a kale or a chard or a collard green, we can get 200 plants per row at one foot space and we'll do two lines. Then we, after we have our soil prep, we'll get the plants in, then we'll pull irrigation lines on them. We'll do three and they emit water on a, on a timer um, twice a day for around 20 minutes. And then from transplant, depending on the leafy grain, typically kale, kale and chard are about 28 days to harvest and collards are a little bit longer. They're around uh, 40. So after that, we'll, after that, um, that period where they're growing, we'll get to the harvest and we'll do about 10 leaves per bunch and we'll get the food to market. You know, I'm struck as I listen to each of you talk about um, not just the process, but I, th I think my, my next question is, you know, each of you guys uh, has really become an expert in your particular, commo I don't, not commodity, but area. Mm -hmm. Who taught you? How did you learn? How did you 
who taught you? I mean, <laughs> because I'm, I'm just sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking about, you know, the time that I spent with each of you on your farms. And, you know, that was only a couple of years ago. And Kamal, it sounds like you have grown probably tenfold since I was, you know, at your place. Marvin, I know you have. Martha, I'm, your operation was already underway. And, you know, what am I trying to say? A lot of people think that farming is just, you know, you get your land and you, you just start planting, right? Or you, you, you get your, your, your first calves and off you go. But it's not like that. And so I would love to hear just about the learning curve for each of you and, and how you acquired the knowledge that you acquired. Because I'm listening to each of you talk and, and there's, I know that there's so much expertise and experience and trial and error that has gone into each of your endeavors. So I would love for you to share a little bit about like, how did you figure out how to do what you do? I know that that's kind of a vague question, but I think it's important for people to understand how much you have invested of your time and attention into doing what you do. So whoever wants to jump in there, I would love to hear. Marvin. I'll take that one. Um, Natalie, my, my hunger for it is to continue the tradition as an African-American farmer, um, to pick up the same trades that my ancestors did prior to me. None of this is new. So to help me out here at Broward Cotter Farm, I have a mentor named Mr. Harrison Campbell. Mr. Harrison Campbell is 88 years old. Mr. Harrison Campbell teaches me from the soil work all the way up to our calves. Um, by having a mentor um, of that age, it, it helps us in two ways. One is therapy for the traditional farmer as well. So that way he's not forgotten for all the hard work that he's been put in for all of these years as a farmer. And then two, he get a chance to teach me and pass something down to me as he's still doing what he loves to do. I now become those hands for his mind. And in doing that, that helps us to gather this and go every day. Um, out of that, I'm hungry um, to learn more about this skill set because agriculture is so much learned every single day and how things work. Um, I was listening to Kamal earlier and I was listening to Ms. Martha of how some of their byproducts is what we can use at our cattle farm. So what's a waste to them is a great access to us. And that's how we should team up as farmers together by working together. And you'd be surprised at how different things cut back. Like say for Kamal, I can help Kamal out hugely on the compost side of it um, for, to help him out on his soil ratio because I have so much of abundance of that. You know, So it's just a handshake deal of how we often just help each other out to have a great product to give our customers and our retail customers a great product that's going to be inside of the farmers market, CSAs, and grocery stores. Amazing. Martha, um, do you have anything? Yes. Um, when we were migrant workers, of course, you see the process when you're picking, you see how the plastic is laid out and how the tomatoes are in stakes. And, and we, when we came to North Carolina and started buying uh, plants, um, uh, from other farmers, we would volunteer to help them, you know, to, to uh, prune, to stay, to, to do the um, tomato twine or, or the pepper twine and to see what kind of sprays that they use and all that. Because when you buy plants from somebody else, if, if, somebody, if that person decides not to plant for you anymore, then you're done. Mm. So we needed to learn, the, you know, the process of how to, you, you do the plant from the seeding to, to, harvest time. So we would volunteer to, we still pay full price, but we would volunteer to help them and to learn the process. Once we started doing our own um, operation, we learned that it, it was a two part. It wasn't just the, the, the land and the plow and the tractor and planting. And it had a lot to do with uh, another side of the business. That's why we like to call it the agribusiness because 
My husband takes care of the field, but I take care of uh, learning. Um, I go to workshops, learning how, what chemicals are new, what fertilizers are new, what um, cover crops can we use that they, they will give our soil back um, uh, what it needs. Because um, um, uh, when we went to one of the trainees, I had a, a great analogy of our soil. It's like a bank account. You would draw during the summer, but you have to put it back during the winter. Otherwise, your account is going to be in the negative and your, your soil is not going to produce because you're not taking care of it. So as we've been, um, you know, so many years in this business, we've been learning, but like the gentleman said, that you always, there's always something new that the, the, the um, tractors right now are, uh, I don't know, I just don't know how to work them because there's the technology is so, so advanced. They have uh, computers and there's so many things, but still you have to take care of the land, know how to take care of the land. And, and most of all, you have to have a, I don't know if it's called thick skin, but farming is a, it's a, it's a risky business. And you have to know what you're doing in order to see, you know, to, if you could move forward because um, if you don't, I don't think anybody can wake up to, today and say, well, I think I'm, I'm gonna become a farmer. That's just not how it works. You have to know what you're doing or other lives, otherwise you lose all your investment. Yeah, yeah. Kamal, what about you? How did you learn what, you, how did you learn this? How did you figure this out? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a trial and error person. So for the first, uh, I think five years, well, four years, it was more so like we, we've ran through, um, <clears throat> the animal farming, uh, it just didn't work well for the system we had at the time. We didn't have really the infrastructure for it. But my undergraduate degree from North Carolina a and is in animal industry. So I actually, I, I know I can raise animals better than vegetables. Um, but really what got us to understand the um, vegetable operation was me the, like going through buffing my head. But then also this winter, me and Howard Allen did like, we took turns to each other's farms. So I got to see his operation. And then I just need to see something like one or two times that I can like figure out, that's just how my mom works. So then when he came here, he would watch our process and he would just give us pointers. So from literally from last winter to now is where the farm really grew. It's, it is just because of the um, tips we got. And then just to understand of me seeing it work somewhere else and then me being able to retrofit it to our specific space. So I would say mentorship for sure for the vegetables. And then also um, with the bees, I have a mentor as well, who's, um, who's an entomologist. So that learning curve for the bees only took about two years. Just And, and it's just because beekeeping has its own, it's like having two farms in one. So just being able to create systems and have those in place in the mentorship it's allowed us to really grow the farm and continue to expand. And so we're going to be doing a lot of outdoor growing this year and uh, bringing in new structures. And we have some other ideas that we're going to be uh, utilizing and bringing to life this year to expand Sankofa. Got it. Got it. Um, what would each of you say is the biggest challenge that you face as a farmer? If you, if you, or maybe you have a, a, a top three or a, a top one, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you face? Um, for me, it would be having the correct um, um, crop insurance because if, if disaster comes and you don't have crop insurance, that one year can bankrupt you. <clears throat> having the right um, credit because I don't think a, a, any farm works on just their uh, funds. We have to rely on, on credit. And the other thing that is very important is having the uh, the USDA, like the FSA or the extension office, um, having uh, people they know and they can help us when we have a disease and we don't know what it is. Uh, when there's programs out there, they can maybe help us. Um, uh, it's it's um, three things, the, the crop insurance, the credit and help from the USDA that get bring the experts in to help us in whatever we don't know that they would, um, you know, sort of pull us out of the problem they were facing at that time. Mm -hmm. Marvin or Kamal, what, what are some of the challenges that you face? Go ahead. I'll take it. Um, Ms. Martha is absolutely right. Um, 
I think there's a big breakdown um, between farmers and USDA. Um, and what I mean by that is if there's a grant that's, that's put out, the language is so intense that it's, it's basically, it detours you from wanting to go forth with the grant. And I think that the USDA needs to have a translator more or less, I say, in the middle that could make it easy for the farmer to understand those grants to make them a little bit easier for us to go after to help them. It's challenging enough for us to already deal with mother nature on a on an everyday basis. Um, mother nature is um, very unforgiving, um, but it's, it's something that we're hungry for to be out there every single day for our customers. And that's what a lot of people don't quite understand is it's challenging out there every day when your tractor don't want to start. It's challenging every day when, you know, the structure of something is broken down or blew away. It's, it's challenging when you lose a livestock animal, you know what I mean? But we need help in certain areas. And, and I just wish that USDA could be more understanding with their grants to give a language transition so that our our uh, understanding of that is, is a little bit easier and that'll help us a long way. Mm, thank you. Kamal, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I think at first we just started the farm. Um, it was, well, getting access to the land. Um, and that was this whole, um, I felt like that was like the hardest thing. It was like, we can just get access to the land. Um, we'll be fine. But now that I'm like, now that things have changed with the farm, I'm thinking more so just the infrastructure component is I think the biggest barrier. If you can have the land, but if you don't have the infrastructure, you can't generate revenue off of it. So um, I think just being able to get the infrastructure to acquire the resources is very difficult because I, I am one of those people who woke up one day and was like, I'm gonna be a farmer. So I, um, it, it, took, it, took a, it took some time to, to get the infrastructure, but what, and can I, I'm going to interrupt you. What do you mean infrastructure? For those, for those of us who aren't farmers, what does infrastructure mean? So it's the, um, the equipment. So I'll, I'll just, I'll go through both operations. So for the vegetable operation, it was getting a well. That was very difficult. Uh, we were dry farming the first few years and that's just yeah. depending on the rain to water our crops. Watermelon loved it. It did really well. And the okra did too, but everything else didn't do too well. Uh, the squash did all right too, but um, that was a, um, a, a, a hurdle. Um, then we had to get a refrigeration unit last year because our volume increased so drastically. Uh, that was another um, piece of infrastructure we needed. Um, starting the farm, we need a tractor that I thought, um, and we don't even use a tractor that much now because we moved to the, the smaller system, but we, we will we'll utilize it now. I'm um, thinking all the implements, like you need a, a bush hog, you need a tiller, you need a plow. Um, you need a seed drill. You need those things to um, to become profitable. Then we had to get the greenhouse, um, which was a whole nother process. We're, luckily, we were able to go through the equip program with the NRCS to acquire that. But then the caterpillar tunnels, we had to get those so we can do a lot of we had to so we could do a lot of indoor growing. That's how we define it. Um, so all of those things were very difficult. Then transportation, um, not only do I have a vehicle for smaller orders, but also have a, a passenger van that we use to drop off the orders. So um, I need a shed to put the equipment in. Um, so then when it came to the bees, getting all the bee equipment, each hive is gonna run you about $200. Um, and that's without the bees. So just all of that infrastructure um, over a, a period of time. And once we put, uh, once we calculate it all, we're looking at over $100,000 that we've had to go out and get access to in just starting the farm. So I think a lot of what's happened is there's an image for us to like reclaim the space, but then once we get into the space is how to keep and maintain the space. And I think that's where the next phase of the conversation will go for black farming is like, how do we get into the space and how do we stay in the space? Because people will give you, people will give you access to land and they'll just wait for you to lose it so they can mm -hmm. scoop up. So I think we've seen that story as well. And just, just within the farming industry, and especially with black farmers, is the access to land, but then how to stay on the land and stay profitable and stay um, uh, uh, um, a productive business 
is what we'll, I think we'll see the conversation transition to. Amazing. Well, and actually that's a great segue into, um, you know, a question that has been uh, posed in the chat and that uh, I was, we were thinking about earlier and that is, or that I was asked in, in the last session, which is how can faith communities support your work? What can faith communities do? I was just talking to someone about this last week and I was thinking that if, um, if faith communities had like made monthly donations to, to farms, they could get the produce at a wholesale price and it wouldn't have to be where we grow celery. Like we're going to be growing thousands of heads of celery. And instead of us um, being like having the rush of the, uh, a food crop or a grocery store to get all those heads out, we can say, hey, it's, it's Thanksgiving. I know that people use a lot of celery during Thanksgiving for stuffing or for turkeys. Um, just because those monthly donations have been coming in, we've been getting them other products. We're going to have this reserve specifically for you all. You can almost source your Thanksgiving meal from the farm at that. So I think relationships like that could be year round. And then the farmer can get those items and the things that the communities want to the churches every month. So I think mm. that could be a one simple way for uh, faith communities to support local farms. Hmm. Marvin or Martha, what do you guys think? I think that um, if not only the faith community, but also the USDA, I think people have a, a basic disconnection from what their food comes from. Either they don't care or they don't want to know or because they just go to the grocery store and grab the, 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 the apple or the tomato or the pepper, but they don't, <clears throat> they don't know what the process is. And, and sometimes things can get a little expensive, but in order to, for, for us to be able to afford to farm, we need to be able to get a, a fair price for our products. Sometimes people don't understand, um, you know, that the, the, the price on, the, on, on some items, but they don't understand the process either. And the, and the faith communities um, also, the, the USA could, you know, sort of, you know, talk about what the food, where the food comes from, um, maybe, go go to farm tours um get connected with your food get get you the connection that is needed for people to comprehend people that are not farmers to comprehend the process of bringing the food to the table hmm. marvin do you have any thoughts there i do um the the faith communities can help us out by two ways um one bringing you know a lot of the, the next generation to a farm for them to understand farming is getting further and further behind because of the history of what people think a farm is or related to through history um and it'll give them a clear understanding of what a farm is and where their food comes from um just like miss martha was just saying a lot of people and i run across it all the time um a lot of people literally think they can go to a big box store and they think that's what our item comes from instead of a farmer such as Kamal and Ms. Martha and, and let, let them know that the hard work was coming from. Um, I think our faith community could involve the farmer more because we're both just alike. The, the preacher himself is not, if not a veteran um, or serviceman, um, they're just like farmers. We're community people, man, that wanna help out in multiple assets. So we really need to team up a whole lot more so we could do the same job and that's feeding our community. So what I hear all of you saying is that that faith communities can really be kind of like the connector, you know, the, the conduit between the farmer and and the 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 customer or the community. Right. And OK, um, Martha, a question came up in the chat for you. Do you hire farm workers to help pick or package your tomatoes and peppers? How had your experience as a farm worker picking oranges influenced your business operation? Um, we currently are using H2A workers uh, because in years past, 30, 40% of, of the crop would stay on the vine because there was no, no, no one to, to pick it. So right now we, we um, hire or, or we bring H2A workers. Uh, but starting us at, uh, at the Orange Grove, let me tell you, um, it's just, um, you get scratched. You, I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it wasn't a good experience. 
but that 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 led us to know that like i said that that wasn't where we we're going to stay it was just like a stepping stone but um we we would i think it's really important to treat your workers really good because they depend you depend on them for their for your crops to be harvested and they depend on you for the work so we uh, had experiences with farmers that were not um, really nice to us so we thought, you know, when we started our business, we, we need to be, you know, nice to our, our, our crew. And we have had the same crew for the past six years because they love to come to us and, and they, <clears throat> the advantage of that, they already know how to do the work. They already, we don't even have to be with them because they already know the process. So if we have to go do something else, we can, you know, just leave and leave them there because they already know the process and they know that we trust them and they trust us. And that is very important. Thank you. You know, I, I think it's so interesting that you all are in North Carolina. That seems to be um, a unique place for, for farmers. I think, you know, in many ways you're, you're very fortunate to have such a vibrant uh, farming community in, in one state. And a question came in, um, what is the most important thing state legislatures can do to help farmers continue to operate successfully? And what are ways that you feel BIPOC farmers can help each other become more successful? Um, if I could just answer the first part. Yeah. Um, I feel like um, with a, a lot of the requirements that, that, that we have to comply with, like food safety and other requirements, I feel like somebody behind the desk thought it was a good idea to, to have that law or that requirement. But it's different for me to be behind the desk and think, okay, this looks good. And you go and implement it and it's not as easy. I think uh, people that are in the farming industries should be consulted or should be, you know, like, like a panel like this to, to mm -hmm. talk to them about if we're going to do this thing, let's just say for food safety. There's so many things in food safety that we do because we have to comply, but they're just time consuming and, and, and it, it, our time will be utilized in, in a better in a different manner. I think if the government would, um, you know, the legislature would, when they pass all this laws and regulation and all that, if they have someone that actually has been in the farm, that's got the experience in the farm, I know that it's important to have a, you know, that you have your education and you have your degree and everything, but that doesn't give you the experience on the farm. I don't have a degree, but I have the experience on the farm. And sometimes, uh, most of the times I, I think about, well, this, just somebody behind this thought this was a good idea because there's no way you can do this. Yeah. And that's to me that's that's one of the that's one of the, the things that we always struggle with. Mm. Mm. So that practical hands-on experience that would allow people to, to make you know regulations that actually were realistic and reasonable. Yeah, that you can comply with because like I said, our product is um, the end consumer uh, is, is raw, uh, they consume it raw. And we know that you have to have certain standards for that food to be safe or safer. But um, somebody that they, they, they ha hands on on the farm can tell you, okay, this is a good idea. This is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marvin, did you have some thoughts on that too? I totally agree with everything Ms. Martha said. She summed it all up for us. Um, the way that she framed it was perfect. Um, on this, on the side of it, um, there's a lot of people that's in the industry that's actually are not in the agricultural world. It's just a position for them to do. Um, but for us, um, there's accountability and traceability methods that we do to cover ourselves here for um, that absence of someone's professionalism. So Ms. Martha summed it all up for me. Amazing. Kamal, do you have any thoughts there? Yes, as far as legislation, I think just from like my, my like experience is to um, I think almost to work with a farm lobbying group because I think that stuff gets so uh, confusing. Like I, I don't know how to read legislation. So you almost dependent on someone else to um, 
to kind of walk you through that process and regurgitate information. And so I think it's to work with an organization that has the values or create kind of your own. Um, as far as like BIPOC farmers working together, one of, I think North Carolina is a very unique place. Like I can name a great number of BIPOC farmers in the area. Well, not like a substantial, I can't name like a hundred, but I can name, I'm like just within like 30 minutes of me, probably around like five or six. I think that's uh, very unique, but I think it's also important to understand that a lot of us are coming into the system at the same time and when a lot of us are learning. So a lot of people who are actively farming out or haven't been farming for more than 10, 15 years. And I, that might be a stretch. It might be five or six. So I think it's important to realize that we're um, coming back into the field after we got pushed out. So there's, the, it's, unless there's like a, like a special circumstance where somebody like really specializes in that um, sp specific field, it's hard a lot of time for us to, to do the things we want to do because we're spending so much time just trying to stay above water mm. in the farming space. Mm. Mm. Well, and that leads me to another question that came up from someone in the audience. And that is, what are some ways that young or beginning white farmers can be allies and support and uplift BIPOC farmers? Uh, I mean, Think the, 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 I don't think farmers has a, a, like a specific race in, in, in mind. Farming doesn't have a specific race in mind. It's just who is willing to do it because I get up at 5, 5 30 in the morning and my day doesn't end until 5 or 6. In the, and that's because I choose to stop. If I wanted to go on, I could go on. But I choose to stop because 12 hours, 14 hours, I think is enough. Yeah. But um, it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have, um, you have to be willing to do it. You have to love what you do and you have to be willing to, to lose because sometimes you do work all year round and you barely got your, your, <clears throat> your cost back and you're happy because you got your cost back, but you don't have anything free for yourself. So it's just depends on your mind frame. Are you willing to, to, to do it? Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, you know, Hispanic or African-American or white. Do you have the love for the for farming, and are you willing to do what it takes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have thoughts on that? What was that question again, please? The question was, what are some ways that young or beginning white farmers can be allies and support and uplift BIPOC farmers? Good. That's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, um, I think a, a big part of that is literally being honest with yourself first before you get into uh, farming because there's a huge stigma there because of who each other are. Um, and that's where a hidden um, uh, problem is at inside of that world there, of who's gonna help each other out. Um, and we need to get down to facts of that. Um, that it, that's a, that's a, a touchy topic right there. I think, mm. I think I'm gonna be vague on that one. But I must say, without backing out of it, you have to be genuine with yourself. Uh, people of color, uh, we are someone that's, we're very sincere about what we're doing without the art of manipulation behind it. That's mm -hmm. the way I frame it. Thank you. Kamal, looks like you have something, some thoughts there. Yeah. I think that um, if there's like a white beginning farmer coming into, um, into the space or to the field, you're, unless you are attached to something else, you're going to be facing all the same challenges as any other farmer. So it's, it's like catering to what Mark just said. So unless that, it's, so just because a white farmer is coming into farming doesn't mean they have access to resources. I see it all the time they come in and they're, as far as production wise and information wise, they're further behind than us. So I think the only thing that we really can do is um, share information as farmers. If I know something's an opportunity over here, that I might not necessarily need, but it can benefit my farming comrade. We share, I think it's the sharing of information because they're gonna be facing all the same issues that we're facing, if not uh, more, because they're just based on location, just depending on where they are. They might be in a, a different, a, com a completely different market from us. So I think there's an assumption that white farmers get um, an abundance of more resources, 
But as I'm saying, they're not. Um, I think there are certain farming strongholds and circles and communities that exist in pockets, as they do everywhere, where people can give you uh, more information. Um, just because you're in that circle, you get it. But I don't think there's a specific advantage um, that whiteness holds in farming like it used to. I, I, I don't think it exists because at the end of the day, it's business. And um, if you can't stay afloat, it all, it's not, you're not going to hold, hold on to your farm a year longer because you're, I mean, you might get some leeway, but it's not, it's not something that's um, a, a, like a, a advantage necessarily now is business. Mm-hmm. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. A couple, some more questions kind of come up in the chat. <clears throat> um, I love what Kamal said about learning from doing and Martha's comment about practical knowledge and Marvin's too. Uh, my question is what failures have our panelists learned from the most? Um, uh, if I could answer that, um, yeah. for me, the, the lack of knowledge in, in let's say like um, scouring, scouring your fields for diseases for insects, if you don't catch that quick, your field could be gone in a couple of days. Um, did that happen to you, days. Martha? Yes, it did. That's, I mean, that's those are costly education. That's costly education, like going to Harvard, but you don't have the degree. <laughs> uh, but um, that and also not having the uh, proper um, crop insurance. Hmm. For me, when we didn't have crop insurance and we had a um, flood, I thought we wouldn't see the next day, uh, you know, in farming, but Thank God we were able to salvage some within the higher ground and the price was good and we at least were able to come afloat. But um, yeah, you need to be diligent, diligent in every aspect of the farming, crop insurance, credits, um, scouting your fields, looking for new um, fertilizer, new fungicides that, that work better on your on your crops. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a never ending, um, so, you have you're always learning amazing anybody else want to we i'm looking at the time we have about eight minutes left so anybody else want to share some maybe a valuable lesson that you learned uh a mistake that you made that you learned from or something mm -hmm. like that yeah I, I think for me the lesson i learned is that um like with the bees they're not technically mine they belong to mother nature and they're just visiting sankofa um and as far as like the vegetable operation, it's, um, I'm out on my time. And like Marvin mentioned earlier, mother nature can be uh, unforgiving. So I, I'm i just utilizing the space until mother nature <laughs> says, I, they don't want, it doesn't want certain things here anymore. So I, I, I think farming has taught me to be a realist. Like it looks good today and it can be all gone tomorrow. And I have to be, I have to be comfortable with knowing that I'm just a tenant um, of the space and it's not actually mine. And I only can do what I can. Um, I only can do what I can until variables change. I'm thinking, Kamal, about some of your early uh, Instagram posts with your, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, your with your bees and, yep. the yep. and all that. You you really have you really have learned by yeah, it, Experience, yeah. trial and error. Yep, trial, trial and error. Yep. I hear that. I hear that. Um, Marvin, did you want to add anything there? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the agribusiness, Miss Martha, once again, is absolutely right. Um, if it wasn't for the Tenny Group for me, um, learning more of agribusiness um, would have been shut down a long time ago. Um, Daryl Tenny, his crew there at the Tenny Group greatly supports us to teach us the different methods of um, the agribility portion of agribusiness to help us support and save us in those areas. So she's absolutely right. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Um, okay, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, what keeps you going? How does farming nurture your lives and your spirits? Um, well, 
like I said from the beginning, you have to love what you do. You have to love waking up in the morning. And if you have a, uh, if the problem arises, you, you know, you know, you can tackle it and you've been through this before, or, you know, but the thing of it is, is that you have to love what you do and you have to be invested in it. Because when I mean invested, I don't mean just personally, you have to be personally, but you have to, all your, basically all your money is in the, in the, in the farming industry. So you have to love it in order to, I think, I think that the, the fact that you produce something for other people to consume, you know, it's, 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 it's a good feeling. It's, it's, a, it's a good experience, mm -hmm. but we need to have the, 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 the other side. This program is called From Farm to Table. We need to know what the farm is in order to bring it to the table. Mm. Kamal and Marvin, do you have any, want to share anything there? Yeah, farming for me, um, farming for me gives me a sense of purpose. Um, farming for me gives me, um, being a, a, a retired veteran now, I get a chance to meet the Lord at that fence line every day now to knowing that I have a sense of purpose again. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for agriculture giving us a, a method of therapy um, to be out there and allowing me to raise beef cattle. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and that's, a, that's something that you just can't find anywhere. If you want to find peace, visit a farmer. Go to a farmer, you'll find peace on a farm because the atmosphere is so different in every farm that you will find a peace of farm, a peace of mind at a farm. Um, it's in the soil. It's where it's at. Love is in that soil. I think I, I don't know. I, I, I thought I used to know the answer to that question, but I think as time has gone on, it's just something inside me that just really enjoys farming. I don't know what I haven't figured that out yet. I didn't know if it was like at first I thought it was the students, but then I realized that like I just like being like they just they're just cool anyway. Um I thought it was like the family component, but like I think there's something I feel out here that I don't feel anywhere else. So I think maybe in 15 years, I'll be able to answer that question. <laughs> like what it is inside of me that keeps me going to keep doing this. Like it doesn't, like I don't get tired doing it. It's, I don't know. I think it's just, it might just be an intersection of all the things that I love to do in life. I think it meets at the farm, I think. Yeah. Well, I think that's the perfect uh, uh, way to end this conversation. Thank you guys all so much. It, again, it has been such a pleasure to get to know all of you and to hear your stories. And uh, I'm so glad to see you guys again. Thank you. <laughs> I really, really am. And, uh, you know, just personally, I wish you every success. I know you've been so generous with your time here today and sharing your stories and your, and your um, expertise and your experience with the audience, I, I hope that they have, have gotten as much out of this uh, rich conversation as I have. So I'm gonna turn it over to Justine now and um, just good luck. Everybody.